this series, we're going to be looking through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, uh, about and, and looking at stories of people throughout Scripture who were friends with God. And there's people in the Bible who were actually called friends of God. So you have the, the I call them like the boys. You got like the Abraham and the Moses, like the boys. And they weren't perfect, but they were the boys. I mean, they were like, it literally says, like God called them friends. But then you also have a ton of people that it's just like so clear. They walked hand in hand with the Lord. Like they knew something about the Lord. They had extra wisdom. They had the Holy Spirit. They had like, they walked with God. And so we're going to be looking at all these stories or a lot of the stories and just pulling out truth from them and saying, okay, how did, how did they walk with God? How did they encounter God in this friendship? And, and what did it cost? Okay, so the idea of being friends with God, uh, it comes best from the passage, uh, the book of John. So if you have your Bibles with me, if, if with you, uh, turn with me to John chapter 15. This is talking about the idea of being a friend of God, but again, it goes way farther back than this to the book of Genesis with Abraham, Moses, those guys. But John chapter 15 is kind of like the champion of the champion scripture for this series. Verse 12. Jesus says, My command is this love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business, but instead I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. So Jesus says, love each other as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? Well, what do we know that he did? It gives you a hint in the next line. Greater love has no one than this to what? To lay down one's life for one's friends. What do we know that Jesus did? We know that he laid his life down for us. Bearing the cross, he lived a perfect and a blameless and a sinless life. And he went to the cross taking the penalty for sin that we deserved. He was crucified and buried. But on the third day, he resurrected, rose from the grave, conquering death, sin, and all evil. He laid his life down. And so then he says, you are my friends. He keeps going, but a lot of people stop there. Like, I'm Jesus' friend. That's cute. That's really nice. Feels like a big warm hug, doesn't it? That's nice. Jesus keeps going. There's not a period. You are my friends. That's it. You are my friends if, what's it say? If you do what I command. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business, but I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. But we see this, thing, this strange thing happen the more we read scriptures like this where this phrase, friend of God, the title of the whole series, is just taking as this cute, nice little saying that we might put on the back of a t-shirt, I'm a friend of God. It's nice to hear, right? Say right. It's, it's nice to hear. I'm a friend of God. But I think it's possible, I think it's possible for this idea of being a friend of God to lose its value and its richness when taken casually. I'm a friend of God. It's on my t-shirt. What are we doing for lunch? You know, right? But the Bible says that there's this God in heaven. He's the almighty God. He's the creator of the universe. He created you. He created everything you see. He's in all things and he's through all things. And he's the reason that you're breathing. 
He is more wonderful. He is more glorious. He is more powerful than you could ever imagine. And he says, I want to be your friend. It's a, in Genesis, it says, your, the very breath that you're breathing is the breath of God that he put in you. And that's what makes us special as humanity is that we carry the breath of God and, and he pours out his spirit, his breath on us and in us. And he died for us, bearing our shame and our sin, conquering the grave. And Ephesians says that he is far above not above, but he is far above all of the rulers, the evil, the powers, the influences of the day, all the things that we worry about. He is far above it. And he's the one who calls you friend. But then we go, we hear that. Like, oh, that's, that's nice. Maybe I'll get a friendship bracelet with him. But Jesus says, You are my friend if you do what I command. As followers of Jesus, we are it says we are adopted into his family. You can have fellowship with me. You can have fellowship with God Almighty, this creator. He said, I paid the ultimate price for this. And this is the God who did not create the, the universe. A lot of people think this. There's a theology that's totally wrapped around this is that he created the universe and then he took a step back and left us. But he leans in too, doesn't he? He is meant to be seen. He is meant to be heard. And he's meant to be experienced. He's the God with us. He's the wonderful counselor the almighty God. He's the father to the fatherless, the defender of widows. He's the empowerer who gives you the power to be his witness. He died for you and he calls you friend. But my fear, and I have no one in mind for this message. I'm not preaching to one particular person. But I like in the, in the big C church, the, all of the churches that make up the church my, my fear is that there's a lot of followers of Jesus who hear that, but they, they, don't, be, they don't believe that God wants to be their friend, that they've, they've messed up too many times, they've gone too far here, they've gone back and forth and back and forth, summer, fall, summer, fall, they, it's been too much, and, and, and God doesn't want to be their friend, or, or they believe those words, but they're like, I, I don't know what that means, so it sounds good, but what, I don't know what it actually means to be a friend of God. This, this God that the Bible describes, I have no idea what it means to be his friend. I don't know what that actually looks like on Monday morning. And so that's my fear. And like we can even do that with the message of the cross too. We hear it at least once a year on Easter, right? <laughs> Jesus died for your sins, took your shame and the penalty and died on the cross and was buried. But three days later, resurrected, conquering death in the grave and you can have life in him. But I think just like being a friend of God, this message of the cross we can take so casually to the point that Jesus becomes not good enough. Like, I don't know, like, yeah, I need, I need Jesus, but I need Jesus and good health care. Or I need Jesus and good health. Like, I, I'm sick, I need, I need Jesus and, I don't know, I need Jesus and babies on demand. I need Jesus and a promotion at my job. I need Jesus and financial stability. I need Jesus and, Jesus and, Jesus and. Because this message of the cross, I've, 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 I've heard it. And it sounds good to be his friend, but I've got other stuff going on, okay? I, like, I, I need stuff. That's a scary place to be. And I, I, I don't say this lightly, like... Loss, no matter what kind of loss it is, grief and the things that loss carry... 
It's hard. Loss is hard, but I, I believe that one of the greatest losses that we could ever have is the loss of wonder for Jesus. All loss is hard. I'm not negating that. But I think one of the greatest losses we could ever encounter is the loss of our wonder of Jesus. To take him casually. Remember Paul came to the church of Corinth? Okay, the church of Corinth was messed up. If you read like a book on the context, I can give you a couple uh, that are just so good. It talks about the context of Corinth and all of the stuff that they had going on. They were doing a lot more than just not coming to church in, in the summertime. Like, they had a lot of stuff. And Paul's like, look, I'm going to get to all your junk. Like, we're going to get there. We're going to get down and dirty. But, and, and, and Paul also, remember, Paul's the one who wrote the book of Ephesians, probably the best theology book we have in our hand daily. And so he knew all, it's not that he didn't know stuff, but he's like, I could come to you with all this wisdom. I could be dropping theology bombs on you, you scholars. Like, I, I could show you up. I could come with all of my eloquent speech. I could try to spice up the gospel so that you hear it in a different way. But really, that's just going to dilute the true message of Jesus and the death and the cross and the resurrection power. And so I, I could do all of that, but all I really, I, I came to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. And it's not that he didn't know other stuff, but he's like, it's just because Jesus is enough. It's not Jesus and, Jesus is enough. He's more than enough. And so if Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, being his friend, but, but what he did on the cross, what he came to do on earth, and the, and, and the evil and the darkness and the powers that he overcame, if we see that as just something he did rather than who he is, then we'll never see him properly. But if we see him as, as the Lamb of God, perfect and blameless, and that he came to die and to conquer so that you could have access to the Father and spend eternity with the one who calls you friend, that's a game changer. But if we see him as like, I don't know, Thor, where he just like stopped by the cross to like take, take a debt and move on with his own life. We're never gonna see him properly. Let's zoom out a little bit. Is this too much for Sunday morning? Okay. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to still have a grandparent around or you are that grandparent, shout out to the grandparents in the house. Uh, you've probably heard this saying, I've heard this saying, I mean, they don't make them like they used to anymore. How many of you have heard that? Show of hands. I've said that, and I'm 26 years old. But, and it's more of a joke because I hear it all the time, but also kind of not a joke because I think there's a lot of truth to it. My, one of my first jobs was, well, I, I, my, one of my, my first official job, I was doing fencing. But uh, before that, like, we're talking... Sixth grade or something, I think, yeah. I was a, a stable attendant. And so I got to work with uh, horses and feeding them, and it was all cute and cuddly. But really, a stable attendant gets the great honor of mucking the stalls, which for you city folk in the house today, that is a professional pooper scooper. <laughs> all right? That's what it is. You think it's cool because you get to pet a horse, but then it's like, I got to deal with that. So that's, that, was, that was my job. So you take this big shovel. You got to clean up all the horse stuff. And uh, then you have to put it in this giant wheelbarrow. And it was the size of me at this, at this time. And so I, I, like, I was, you had to take it all the way back by, way past the barn, way past all the pastures. And you had to dump it in just this giant pile 
of horse crap. And so like, I was like, I'm not going back there more than I have to. So I would pile it in this wheelbarrow and I'd wheel it all the way back there. And half the time I couldn't even get it back there. I could barely lift this thing, it was so heavy. And so half the time it would dump out before I could even get it all the way back there and I'd have to pick it up by hand. No, I'd shovel it back in. And, but, okay, in this context, I would hear that phrase a lot. Oh, I, I got to put a little accent. I'm terrible at accents, but I got to do it. Like, oh, they don't make them like they used to anymore. You know, like the southern thing. It could be, oh, like, oh, back in my day, we would drive those Ford 8-in series tractors. We'd drive those suckers into the ground. But now they just take a couple wheels and throw a big hunk of plastic on it. You know, they don't make them like they used to anymore. <laughs> You know, and it's like, okay, whatever, Grandpa. But, like, I'm just cleaning up horse crap. But they, you get, like, the people say that about cars, too, right? Like, cars are cool. They look slick, and maybe they have more gas mileage, but they don't make them like they used to anymore because it feels like you get in one fender bender and your car's totaled, right? Or, or people say it about houses. People say it about houses. Or people say it about kids. They don't make them like they, you know, <laughs> just making sure you're still with me. Kid. They, don't make, they don't make kids like they used to anymore, said every generation ever about the generation following them. But there's, there's probably some truth to it. But you hear all that stuff. And I'm not a car expert, but I think that it's a little telling of, of the way that things are going. We like things faster, made faster, received faster, and, be, and before we know it, there's this shorter or easier or cheaper way to do everything. And so we live in a world that's addicted to the quick and the instant and the shortcuts of life. We want the shortest way to success, the path, to, the path of least resistance. Often finding ourselves satisfied with mediocre results or a car that gets totaled when somebody scrapes it. But you can't have a horse without working in the stall, getting down and, or paying some kid to do it. <laughs> but you can say that about a lot of things. You can't be a Marine without going through the intense training. You can't be a Bible scholar without years of learning and writing and reading and continued learning, and maybe by the end of it, you're like, I don't even know if I know anything more, you know? Like, you can't, and I, I think the same thing is true about being a follower of Jesus. We read through the, 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 four, the first four books of the New Testament, and Jesus' call to commitment is clear. He wants everything or nothing. In the New Testament, it would have been a crazy idea to call yourself a Christian, but not be a devoted follower of Christ. And so I wonder if people would say that phrase, they don't make them like they used to anymore. I wonder if people will ever say that about Christians, where, man, they just aren't like they used to be anymore. I, like, I, wanted, like, I took church history and just reading through the stories of the early church fathers and all these people who would just die horrific deaths because they wouldn't burn incense to a king. Or like, look up how many people die just to get the Bible that you have in your hands. I wonder if they look at the church now and just like, man, it's not like it used to be. Jesus says in John chapter 15, you are my friends if you do what I command. But Dylan, I thought salvation was a free gift. What do you mean if I do what he commands then, then he, it's not by works. You're right. The Bible says that it is by grace through faith that you've been saved. What else does it say? In the book of James, it says, but a faith without works is dead. It's a dead faith. And Jesus says, if you want to be my friend, I... I want to be your friend, but if you want to be my friend back, you'll do what I command. Because Jesus isn't just a Savior, but he's also Lord. And most people are okay with that Savior part, but a little bit more unsettled with the Lord part because it requires a greater surrender. And that's the great paradox of our faith is salvation is a gift of grace through faith, but not by works, but this concept of friendship does require a response. The Bible uses this really beautiful imagery of Jesus as the bridegroom coming back one day for his bride. 
the church. We are his bride. And so from that picture, we don't, we don't take away that Jesus wants this militant obedience. Right before that scripture in John 15, this is the one that John 15 is really known for. We'll probably read through the whole thing throughout the series. Before he gets to the friend part, he goes, abide in me and I in you, which could be translated another way, make your home in me and I'll make my home in you. He doesn't want this militant obedience, but he goes, don't you understand how much I actually love you? Like before you even thought about loving me, I loved you. When you were in your mother's womb, I knew your name. Before you met your parents, I knew who you were. I knew the hairs on your head. I knew the work that I set out for you to prepare in advance for you to do. I knew you and I loved you. I still love you. This friendship that he desires with us, he died for it. He laid his life down for his friends. Raise your hand if you're married in the house. All right. When you really love your spouse, don't you know this is true? That you'll do anything for them? I hope that's the case for you. But like if you're really, if you're in love with your spouse, it's like I will do anything. I'll take a bullet for you. I don't care how much. It doesn't matter. Like I don't care if it makes sense or not. I'll drive 16 hours to be there for an hour with you. I don't care if it makes sense to anybody else. I love you. It doesn't matter. I love you. And so here's the bridegroom, and he's coming back for his bride for us. He's, it, do, it doesn't say, like in any of the scriptures, like he's coming back for the best leader, the best preacher, or the best singer, the best ministry, whatever. The most accomplished. He says, I'm, I'm coming back for the most given, the most yielded, the most surrendered, the most in love. I'm, I'm coming back for my friends. I'm coming back for my bride. Who wants nothing more than just to seek my face? That's who I'm coming back for. There's someone very special in the Bible who knew this very well. Her name was Mary of Bethany. I wasn't originally planning about, I wasn't, I wasn't planning talking about Mary of Bethany. I, was, I wanted to talk about Moses or one of the boys, you know. But I was like, that's how you start off a sermon series like this. But I, I, I was like, this is that word of knowledge, word of encouragement for you that I felt like the Lord gave me. I was like, like if we don't understand that, then we can't get to Abraham or Moses or, or any of the apostles. or We can't get to any of that because if we're not careful, We'll, like, we'll look at all the th- great things that they did. And they were far from perfect. Don't get me wrong. But Moses, these guys did amazing. They saw ama- they, they heard amazing things from God. They did amazing things. And so we'll look at their life and it's like, man, I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna see that. I want to be able to do what they did. Noah, I, maybe not build an ark, but I, like, I want to <laughs> I I do the amazing things that they did. And so if we're not careful, we'll, we'll seek after the fruits and the works before ever understanding the Mary of Bethany side of everything. To put it in today's terms, like I, 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 I want to I sing like that guy or, or teach or preach or I, I, I want to pray like them. I want to be able to prophesy. I want to be able to heal the sick. Every time I lay a hand on somebody, like I want to see them healed. And so we desire to do all of these great and powerful things but they're only things that come from a, a fully given and yielded life. These things only come not from talent, but through fasting and prayer. These things only come from that secret place, the hidden life. Everybody wants to be hidden until you actually are, right? But it come, like these great works and wonders and God working in us and through us only comes from here. And so we're going to take a look. We got to go here first. Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany, we see her three times in scripture. We have three stories of her. I don't think, we don't have time to get get through all of it. I would love to just read through them and just leave it at that. Um, But one of them is like a chapter and a half long. So we won't do that. Maybe we'll get to it. 
uh, next week. But one of the times that we see Mary of Bethany is in the raising of Lazarus. Do you guys remember that story? Jesus comes to raise Lazarus from the dead. It says he's like a couple days late, according to Mary and Martha. And he comes, Martha comes and greets him. Mary stays back in the room. I think she's with Lazarus still. But Jesus says to Martha, he's like, hey, send for Mary. And, and Mary knew who Jesus was. So can you imagine the king of kings sending for you? Like, I, I, I want to be with Mary. C can you bring Mary on out? So she comes, she gets up, she, she's faithful. All three of these stories, by the way, Mary ends up at Jesus' feet. So she runs out of the room. She comes to Jesus, but she's weeping. She's full of grief. She sits at Jesus' feet and she's like, <laughs> like, I love you. But if you would have been here two days earlier, you could have healed Lazarus. But now he's dead. And we know how the story ends, right? It's this preamble to Jesus' death and resurrection is Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. We see Mary again in John chapter 12. This one's shorter, so I'll just read it. John chapter 12 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. So <laughs> Lazarus is back to life, and he's just chilling, eating dinner with him now. It's like this dude was dead. Like he was dead. He was rotting, actually. Like Mary, Mary was like nervous for Jesus to go into the room because she's like, it's going to stink, Jesus. Like it's going to smell. He still raised him. Verse 3, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. It says the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. says he didn't say this because he actually cared for the poor but because he was a thief as a keeper of the money bag he used to help himself to what was put into it Jesus says leave her alone so in all three of these stories that we have of Mary of Bethany she ends up at Jesus's feet but also it's really cool because Jesus defends her in every single one of them Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. <clears throat> you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So we have Mary with perfume. Think about how much money you make in a year. Get it in your head. That's how much this one jar of perfume is worth. She takes it. Some theologians or scholars say that it didn't probably even have a screw top lid. So once you broke it, it was like a one use thing. You broke the jar and you had to use all of it. And so she broke a year's wages worth of perfume and just poured it on Jesus' feet. And the disciples are like, and Judas, you could have just given the money to Jesus. Why are you like dousing him in perfume? It says the whole room was filled with perfume. And some of you are like, that'd be too much. I'd be walking out of the room. But like... You could have just given it to the poor. You could have just given the money to the ministry. But she was only concerned about one thing. The third time we see Mary of Bethany, this is where we'll land. Luke chapter 10. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Martha's sister Mary sat at the, at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. I always wondered what she was making. I don't know. Use your imagination. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, I love that. You're worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from her. And so these three stories. <clears throat> we don't hear about Mary of Bethany, really. Uh, any stories about her 
throughout any rest of the scripture. And if I'm being totally honest with you, there's people that came along later in, in, in scripture that did way more than Mary of Bethany did. If you read the book of Acts, like the early church, they sold everything. It's probably worth a lot more than a year's wages. And so we're like, oh, that was the most expensive gift ever did, given to Jesus. But it's like they sold everything. There's people that gave more, led bigger ministries, won more people to Jesus, did all these things. But Mary of Bethany says her story will be told throughout all of eternity. Okay, but, but th these guys did way more than Mary of Bethany. Why is this so important? And it's because she got a hold of an ancient secret, the, the very heart of God. She, she began to understand that sitting at Jesus' feet was the one thing, the most important thing that she could have done. She knew in that moment there's, there's nothing in the world that I could do that would be better than to just sit here with Jesus and listen to his teaching. Jesus walks into the house with his disciples and they're, they're hungry. Like they have actual needs that need met. And so I, like I see, honestly, I see a lot of myself and Martha like, oh, these guys need fed. Like we got to cook some food. But Mary does something totally unconventional and she goes, God just walked in my house. God is in my house. <laughs> so I don't care about dinner. He's in my house. There's not, there's not one thing that's more important than, than being right here. G Jesus, I just want to hear you. Like, I want to hear your teaching. I want, I want to obey everything that I just, you're God. So if there's two things that I can offer you this morning, if you want to write them down, if you want to memorize them, or if you want to just forget them, don't do that though. <laughs> Two things I'd like to offer you this morning. Number one, if you want to be his friend, you must learn to sit at his feet. If you want to be friends of God, you've got to learn to sit at his feet. Number two, before you go and do, you have to come and be. Before you go and you do, you have to come and be. I thought it was appropriate to <clears throat> end and worship one thing that I forgot to say this, uh, in the word of encouragement is that I as I encourage you to lean in I want to say I met with a missionary friend of mine for lunch, and he said, oh, you're headed into the summer slide, the, the church season where it's, it's like it's a little bit easier. And, and, you know, they encourage all the messages to be a little bit more surfacey because people are just checked out. And so, so you're probably like loving the summer because you don't have a lot going on. And I'm like looking at our schedule, honestly, and I'm like, it's not slowing down at all. <laughs> I, honestly... If you ask the staff, I was concerned we were doing too much this summer. I was like, I, we have so much that I'm not even sure we can communicate it all. But I want to encourage you that our staff, our church leadership, we are committed to leaning in. We are, we're not going to go basic on Father's Day. We're going to baptize people. And they say, don't do big worship nights because nobody's going to come. It's the summertime. They'd rather be outside. But we have a worship night tonight. They say, save your money and, you know, whatever. Like, and it's important to steward well, but we're going to keep feeding the hungry. And we're going to continue to partner with Cleveland Elementary. We're going to continue to do all these outreaches and all these things. We're going to continue to meet in homes and be in community with one another. We're committed. We're, we're leaning in. We're going to do church picnics. We're going to have events for families, kids, and students. We're not... We're, we're not checking out. We're sold out for Jesus. And so we're leaning in too. I, I wanted to say that we are in this, in this together. Okay, a couple more things before we, before we worship. We're just gonna reprise one of those songs. One thing on my mind a lot is that 
there's a lot of people in the big church, the global church today, that want to do all of these great things. They want to cook the big dinner. They want to do all these powerful and great things for the Lord. And all of those things are great, but they're even greater when it begins in the hidden place and in the secret place with Jesus through prayer and fasting, not done because we're talented, but because we prayed and fasted for this for years. Like all of those things that come in great power and great wonder and great might because the Lord did it through us when we're just like, I just wanna stare at your face. Would you just use me forever? Would you just use me for whatever? Would I, I just live a yielded life to you? But there's so many in the church that just, they, they just wanna jump to the fruit. Like, like when it comes to like a really cool thing to serve, like a, a, an outreach opportunity or a, a global ministry is doing a great, awesome mission trip and, and it's a benefit if it's on the beach or it, you know, if, if we can go and pick up a mic or pick up a guitar and like do all these great things for the Lord, then we're like, look how obedient I am. It's just Jesus. But when it comes to being Mary of Bethany and just sitting with Jesus, it's like, I don't, I don't care. I don't like, it's not about my desires. It's not about my wants. It's not about, it's not about my needs. I like, I have needs. It's just about you though. Like it's, it's, you are more than enough. What you've already done is more than enough. If you poured out nothing else, I would be satisfied. How come when it comes to that, it's like, we'll get to it when we have time. Like obedience, when it's visible and open and everybody sees, it's a lot easier. But, but obedience, when it's just with Jesus and behind closed doors, where you open up the door and you close it behind you and you say, I'm not leaving this room until I meet with you, just because I wanna meet with you. That type of obedience it's a little bit more difficult because nobody sees that. But it's got, it's got, Mary of Bethany would say, you've, like, we've got it all backwards. Because before you can do the stuff and do the things and work in power and pray and prophesy and do these amazing things, I guess got to start there. You've got to be so in love with Jesus that obeying his commands, is, that's an easy yes. The, like, it's going to be hard. It's gonna get dirty, it's gonna get, it's gonna get strange because oftentimes obedience begins with repentance and that gets messy, doesn't it? But Mary would say like it's gotta start at his feet because that's the place where you receive the spirit of God, that's where you fall in love with God, where obedience becomes not a, a grocery list, a checklist of just militant obedience, but it's our response, it's our natural response of love to the one who calls us friend, the one who died for us and was resurrected, who sits far above all else. Out of that love, our yes to obedience becomes much easier even when it's hard because it's out of love. Would you stand with me? Let's, let's, we're gonna do a little bit of worship. <clears throat> but I, I, I wanna encourage you, uh, well, one, I, I wanna encourage you, this is just like a taste of, of tonight. Come back at five o'clock tonight. We have legitimately created and carved out time just to be and seek the face, be with God and seek the face of Jesus. The first hour of the worship night is pretty unprecedented. We've never really done this before, but it was on Alex's heart. It was on the minds of a lot of our staff members. And so we're just creating the first hour of, of just Pray, like a prayer room time of just seeking the face of Jesus. Like it's just gonna be a couple people up here just playing some music in the background. But for the first hour, we're just gonna seek after Jesus. And then we're gonna come together for the next hour and a half and, or so and, and really and worship and dive in head first. But I wanna encourage you to come back tonight for five o'clock. This is just a taste. But um, I also wanna encourage you that this summer when we, when we worship, so right now and tonight, but all throughout summer, that we would be a people who, who seek Jesus' face in worship rather than our wants or desires or needs, that, that in, in worship we could somehow like completely disappear from our own picture. 
that we wouldn't think about anything else, but we would just, like, if it helps, it helps me if you would read Revelation 4, where there's just this throne room of God, and there's millions of angels surrounding the throne of God, and just all they can, all they can manage to spout out of their mouth is just, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's it. That's all it's, it's that he's enough. He's more than enough. It's not about anything else. And so if we could just disappear in our own picture, and it's just about the face of Jesus, if we could get to that place where Mary of Bethany found. That's the beginning. It's the beginning of friendship with God. You are my friends if you do what I command. And the greatest command, Jesus says, is this, to love the Lord your God with everything you have. That's the first and greatest command. All right. So we're going to worship. Last thing, sorry. <laughs> I, this summer, I, I am like convicted that, that the enemy doesn't really care about church attendance. It, it, he doesn't, because there's a lot of people who go to church and aren't ever changed. I'm more convinced that the enemy is fearful of our obedience. He is, he is nervous when somebody fully yields their life and gives all of their givenness that they can give, their most priceless possessions that they hold dearly to their heart. When we live a yielded life to God, I think that's what shakes the gates of hell. I, like I, I think that's what he was worried about the most. Not church attendance or how many events you came to. And so we're leaning in, but that's what we're leaning into. It's like, I, I, I want to be so yielded and surrendered that I, 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 I desire nothing but to obey all that he commands. I want to declare war in that prayer room space on, on any distractions this summer, on any anxiety, on any fear, on all the cares of this world. God, would you mold in us and create in us a heart that craves nothing but you. That, that a hunger would bring us back to a desperation and a hunger that can only be satisfied by you. That's what we want, Lord. Okay, let's worship. <laughs> Let me pray over us. Oh God, we are so ready for summer. <clears throat> Through the power of your Holy Spirit, would we be brave and courageous enough to lean in to you? to all that you have. It goes further than this series. It goes further than the worship night. But I believe that you can come in power and might and in glory, and you can come upon us and fill us and baptize, in your, baptize us in your Holy Spirit. God, would that mark our summer, that summer 25th, 2024, that's, that's, that's when I, I, I met with God. And I learned the weight and the value and the power that comes with the phrase, I am a friend of God. We want nothing more than to sit at your feet pour out all that we have because we know that you look back at us and it's like that's right it's all for me and I'm all for you God we're so thankful for your heart for us your love for us your grace for us what more could we want we love you we give you all of our praise all of the glory in Jesus name and everybody said Amen.